you would always want to visualize the perfect ride. So if I was visualizing something, I was visualizing the perfect move, the perfect at that time. I would never visualize what I did wrong. I'd always visualize what I did right. Welcome, my name is Doug Simcox, and this is Beyond the Shoots as presented by Parasite Systems. In this episode, I continue my interview with Mike Swearingen, a cowboy, an all-around cowboy from upstate New York. We pick up where we left off, beginning the 1979 rodeo season. Mike talks about the business of rodeo, both the economics and the mental aspect of his riding. And now you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. Search for Beyond the Shoots and follow us. I hope that you enjoy this second episode about the all-around cowboy, Mike Swearingen. We're back with Mr. Mike Swearingen, going to continue our conversation from a week ago. And Mike, how are you doing this evening? Oh, I'm doing great, Doug. How about you? I am good. I'm good. You've had dinner, I hope. Yep, you got a full belly. <laughs> <laughs> and all settled in and ready for a for a nice conversation, I hope. Yeah, if I don't fall asleep talking to you, uh, well, you a <laughs> well, I'll be quiet. You do most of the talking. If you if you go to sleep while you're talking, that's pretty that's quite a bit of talent, what, what that is. <laughs> all right. So picking up where we were last week, Mike, we got to the 1978. You said that was the year the lights came on. And according to my records in the APRA that year, you were the bareback bronc riding champion, you were the steer wrestling champion, and you were the all-around champion. We talked a little bit about going to Florida. You, you had a house fire, you bought a new truck, and you were doing some ARA and some, or mostly ARA, I should say, some IPRA, International mm-hmm. Professional Road Association, but staying pretty close to the house. And then 1979. What, uh, tell me what you remember about 1979. Now, you're no longer a rookie. This is your sophomore season. Tell me what you remember. Well, I, uh, I started going a little bit, and I can't remember where I was at, but I, you know, was in an IPRA rodeo, and it was relatively early in the year. I, I'm going to say April, May-ish, somewhere in through there. And, uh, talking to one of my cowboy friends, you know, buddies, and um, they told me that I ought to go jump in the truck with Jack Wiseman. Oh, okay. And hit a bunch of rodeos. And I had known Jack, I, you know, and, uh, you know, because he'd come to some, you know, a bunch of the rodeos, and I mean, he was all around hand, and he rode bulls and, and steer wrestle, but mm-hmm. mostly, uh, mostly steer wrestling. And, uh, you know, at that time he, he did write a few bulls, but anyway, make a long story short, I, uh, I had, uh, somebody suggested I go up and talk to Jack about, about traveling. And I was a little bit hesitant, you know, and then, you know, I kind of thought about it a little bit and I said, well, maybe I go talk to him and see, he said, sure. He says, we'd, uh. Let me make room for you. Mm-hmm. So somewhere along the line, I think probably June or July, I climbed in his truck and we went to some rodeos. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, if the national anthem played at an IPRA rodeo, we were there. Okay. <laughs> we, we went to a town and there was always probably anywhere, at least seven or eight guys in the truck all the time and uh hauling horses and stuff we went to a pile of them so did you stay out all week <clears throat> pretty much stayed in the truck with him uh most of the summer mm-hmm. uh there's a few times that uh got out and you know i'd come back home or something you know and, uh, but you know there were a few of them that i i made back here most of the rodeos are either IPRA or they're co-sanctioned with, you know, someone back here with the, like Florida and uh, SRA. Uh, some of them are co-sanctioned. So some of the cards that I already is holding, like mm-hmm. the APRA card, 
uh, points that count both ways. Mm -hmm. So I was making points, but I was mostly concentrating then on making the IFR. Okay. And, and seven or eight in the truck, how many horses were you hauling? Well, we always had two for two, sure. One team. And, and yeah, the team, <clears throat> but a lot of times Jack's wife barrel racing. So she had her horse too. Okay. So, okay. You know, and well, then she was teaching school at the time, so a lot of times she couldn't get and go full time until school got out. Okay. Once school got out, she'd climb in, and then, you know, she traveled with us. Okay. And then, so a couple questions come up: seven or eight guys. Uh, that's a lot in a truck. Um, you better all get along pretty decent. Were there some stories there, Mike? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there, there's we got we did get along, uh -huh. but boy, when you're Shack wacky and you know you're young and you're full of it and no, um, no, wait, no wait, whoa 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 stop stop <laughs> stop uh I think I heard the word shack wacky yeah I'm not sure what I I don't know that I know what that is <laughs> being cooped up you get oh. that truck and you're, oh. you're traveling you know you're going you know you're in that truck you get out you ride you get back in the truck you go you get out you ride and it just it you're in the truck way more than you're out of the truck. Yeah. And after a while, you know, I mean, I call it shack wacky cabin <laughs> fever, whatever you want, you know, you got to let some energy and some steam on a little bit. Yeah. And we had guys, you know, me and Jimmy Myers at one year, <clears throat> and I don't remember if that was the year that Jimmy was with us. Cause I traveled with Jack for uh, three years or so. Oh, really? <clears throat> off okay. And on. But, uh, that one year, uh, you know, Jimmy was with us. Well, me and Jimmy were the smallest guys in there. He had guys like Tom Thumbling, Dan Daly, uh, oh, Bruce Emery, Jack. You know, I mean, there were some big bulldoggers in that truck. And, uh, you know, most of us, we got along pretty good. Old Jimmy, he would lay up in the overhead and just leave me alone. He kind of crawled up in there and he just kind of chilled out. Nobody bothered him too bad, but. And me and Dan get the horse around, or somebody else would get the horse around. One Wally Terry, uh, he, he was a little bull rider from California. Oh my goodness, you know he'd get going, and then oh, we had a we had a good time. Pick on each other, and I don't know. We get the rest around in the back of the truck, and about half kicked beside <laughs> the camper out one time. Right. <laughs> so, right. You know, but you know, just it was just like you kind of burn off a little bit of energy, and and. Uh, you know, it was just, we had a good time. It was a great time. Okay. It really was. So, so did everybody share in the driving? And no, no. Jack did not let very many people drive his truck. Okay. Jack did probably 80% of the driving himself. Okay. And he, every once in a while, somebody would get in there and I don't know, I think it was probably about the second or third year that I was going, he ever let me get behind the wheel. Oh, and right. a lot of times, a lot of the guys wanted to, you know, yeah. he was getting let's do something besides just laying back here and, you know, and passing the time. But, uh, you know, Jack was pretty, pretty careful of who he let drive. Okay. Okay. And, and so another question, um, you all are headed to the same rodeos, right? Um, mm -hmm. who run the books, who made sure y'all drew up, right? You got there, right? Uh, you, you know what I'm saying? So somebody didn't get yeah, drawn yeah. out. Yeah. Right. Yep. Jack, Jack took care of most all the entering. He was, he was Captain Jack. He, he ran, he, you know, he said, okay, if we were going to meet him somewhere, this is where we're going to meet, you know, and then go from there, you know, and, uh, you know, he just we never worried about getting entered. Uh, there were a lot of times that we, we went to three rodeos in one day. We'd go to a morning slack and then go to an afternoon performance somewhere and then go to a night performance mm -hmm. and then start, you know. And uh, there were several weeks we could go to seven or eight rodeos. Now, when we went to slack and stuff, there were a lot of times uh, that, of course, if we were going, I might not be in a bareback or saddleback riding because they didn't have slack in that. I see. But I probably would be in the bull riding and steer wrestling. Mm -hmm. So even though we were going to three rodeos in one day, I didn't didn't get to get on all my, you know, 
mm-hmm. all all four events at each rodeo. But you knew so, that before you got there, right? I mean, it wasn't like oh, you yeah. had, okay, so you didn't pay right. fines or fees or anything oh, like no, that. Oh no, no. Okay. He, we just didn't get under, you know. Okay. And see, back then you called the secretary of the IPR rodeos and and uh you called and talked to the rodeo secretary oh, and Jack was very good at saying, "Okay, I've got, you know, uh, six bulldoggers and I got right. five bull riders, you right, know, and right. so a lot of times we would go and, and get entered and uh, there were a couple other trucks going too. Red Dolphin had a truckload of guys that were traveling so a lot of times we would have to work some rodeos a little bit backwards to get everybody in as many events as they could. Okay. And you know, I was a little bit more difficult. Me and Dan Daly mm-hmm. were both working for events at yep. those rodeos and so you know, sometimes we'd have to give up some to go. Okay. You know, but and would some you of the better paying ones we would try to get out during a performance. Sure. And would you get split up on occasion? Hey, I'm gonna hang out here and I know you guys are headed off because we just did slack, but I'm there's money here and I want to stay here for my from my bronc riding and, and my bull riding, maybe. Would you get nope. split off and then ke- catch back up or no? No, nope. no. Nope. If we if we were in the truck with Jack, we were, you know, we were there. Now, certainly would, would if I said, okay, I'm going to, you know, go somewhere, you know, um, on a certain weekend, you know, I might go somewhere else and then meet up with them somewhere. Um, but to say, no, I'm going to stay here, it very seldom happened because okay. we, we pretty much knew that he was going to go to the best rodeos and the most rodeos that he could get to. Yeah. And he knew, I mean, logistically, he had it all planned out. No no backtracking, all that sort of thing. Pretty efficient in his scheduling? Pretty efficient, yep, yeah. for, for what we could get done, you know. You bet, um, you bet. And and when your truck rolled in, I mean, you had a bunch of toughs, right? A bunch of a bunch of champions in the truck. Um, oh yeah. So when you guys come, ba- so so I gotta ask, going down the road, Jimmy Myers, Dan Daly, um, Jack Wiseman, you know, these veteran cowboys that are coming up through that that are winning championships and such. What was the effect on each other? What did you notice? Did yeah? How did it affect your riding? Maybe. Well, when you haul the champions and you compete against champions time after time, um, if you're not paying attention and if you're not learning something, mm-hmm. you ain't going to last very long. Okay. And I picked up a lot of little things. Um, I was I was just really, really starting to ride pretty fair. Mm-hmm. Uh, I hadn't, I wasn't at my peak yet i don't believe you know mm-hmm. certainly back then mm-hmm. <clears throat> but um little things like jimmy myers helped me i was having a heck of a time there for a little while where my hand would come out of the rope mm-hmm. and the harder i'd try i on on real on the real rank bucking bowls you know mm-hmm. i'm not talking about you know the ones that were just real good guys i didn't have a problem with but when i was getting into the with the uh IFR, NFR, any, you know, the high, high, um, Mark Bucking Bulls, you know, the mm-hmm. real rank ones or something, they had a trick to them. Mm-hmm. I was having a lot of trouble with it. And, uh, <clears throat> we just had me, you know, talking to Jimmy and, and he says, well, where are you putting your hand? And the, the harder I tried, the farther I'd put my hand in the rope. Oh, and, okay. uh, you know, I just, it just, well, he just rolled my hand out of the rope. He said, well, where are you putting your rope? You know, and yeah. I told him, he says, you can't do that. He yeah. says, you got to put it right here across the calluses. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, don't feel like I have much. He says, don't matter. Mm-hmm. It's like the bind in the bareback rig. And you get your hand in there. And then he, then he explained it to me, you know, he says, put it back here and then roll your wrist up. You know, I did. And it, he said, where did it stop? I said, well, down here. He says, well, that's where you want to start. Right. So it don't stop. Okay. And boy. Just little things like that, yeah, and yeah. just that, that. Then I took off, you know, yeah. and got by a lot of them, them rank ones. Yeah, and <laughs> and what did you notice about the attitude of these guys going down the road? These guys that are just winning, and you're you're new, you're you're getting in the truck with them for the first time. Yeah, what what? They, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. They they just had a mindset that that was that was their job, and you know they were going to go out and do it, and they. They could have a good time and fun along the way, but it was all business. When they got there, 
they wanted to make sure that they knew their cattle, you know, and like I'm hauling a bunch of tough bulldoggers for the most part. And, you know, so they would go check it out. And like the Jack's crew, he got to a, a contractor, had a pen of steers that, that were fresh. Mm-hmm. Uh, his truck, we'd roll in there and we might spend an hour or two just throwing these steers down and trying to get them ready for competition. And it, it wasn't just for us. Mm-hmm. It was for the good of the whole rodeo, you know, because you want to see a good bulldog and, and, you know, in Jack's mind. And yeah, we want to have the advantage of being able to throw something down, you know, that, that isn't going to fight us. So we would go in there and work them steers, you know, and throw them down and get them softened up a little bit. And, uh, you know, that was just the way, just the way we did it. We'd roll in on a, you know, on a, well, especially on your very first performance, if they haven't been run yet, especially the freshers. Oh man, we get our lunch eaten and back pens, but we spend a little bit of time with them. And mm-hmm. then boys would take notes. Okay. This steer, you know, he tries to pull his head away from you a little bit, or this one's soft. And, you know, so they took care of business that way uh, big time. Yeah. And, and along those lines, um, did you keep books? And what I'm, what I'm, what I'm hearing is you, you started to learn the steers. Did you go enough and see the steers enough? Did Jack, did you guys have a book, whether it's on the steers or on the bulls or on the Bronx or whatever? Um, yeah. Jack, Jack, Pretty much did, and and a couple of the other boys in the steer wrestling did. Um, they would they would kind of compare notes a little bit, and I they did have a book, you know. And but Jack, you know, some of them boys had a good memory and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. You know, when it come to the rough stock riding, and I I kind of think Jimmy was kind of the same. The, us roughies were were a little bit different because, I mean, I know as far as me. I couldn't remember what I got on yesterday unless he really was really, really good. And I did mm-hmm. good on him. He cow killed me and, <laughs> right, you know, right. uh, <laughs> this, yeah, but, uh, I never did, okay. you know, and there are times I wish I had, but the way, the way I look at things is I don't have any control over that animal. So I can't help what he does. Mm-hmm. So if I have a book on him and I say, okay, he goes out there and he turns back to the right. And I'm ready for that. And he goes back and turns back to left. He's going to throw me off because sure. my mind is going to the right. Yeah, yeah. Now, if I have a bull that <clears throat> I know that how he leaves there hard and maybe he'll turn back to the right, um, that's okay. But where I would concentrate a lot of times, if I knew that bull and mostly the bulls, not the horses so much, mm. but the bulls, if I knew this bull was going to jump out there and turn back to the left and go away from my hand, I would start programming my mind to make sure that my my left foot was in there so that when he'd come around that corner, he would pull me around the corner. So that was that was the most uh, pre-thinking a lot of times that I would do. After that, I just tried to ride him jump for jump. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so talk a little bit about, for our listeners, when we talk about mind programming, um, I'm assuming that's getting ready for that particular ride, what you know about that bull. And in your case, when you're running four different events, competing in four different events, you have to spend some time going, okay, now wait a minute. I'm, I'm getting on a bull now. Um, I know a bit about the bull. Uh, I have my, you have your routine when you get over the, over the bull in the buck and shoot and your rope is on. So step us through, how do you program your mind? Do you, uh, what goes on in your mind? Let me start there. The bull rope's on, Mike. He's loaded. And they say, okay, you're up, cowboy. First off, I got to find my mind. <laughs> okay. Fair <laughs> enough. No. Yes. Yes. But not Generally, for the most part, because I've already got my adrenaline's already been run. I've already been through event, three events mm-hmm. for the most part by the time I get to the bull riding. So my motor's already been running pretty good. Um, when I get in there, I, I basically always try to do the same thing repetitiously so that I didn't forget something, you know, and, and getting in a hurry, you know, with, uh, there'd be a lot of times I'd have a re-ride or something, a horse riding. They'd run, especially in a bronc ride, and they'd run the bronc in before the bolt, 
and I would have to get on my saddle bronc, free ride, and then get off of him, get my chaps changed, get my spurs changed, get my bull stuff on, and then go right to that. Mm-hmm. So um, <clears throat> I would have to make sure that my free ride program was basically the same. Okay. Okay. And and then so then my mindset wasn't uh, I wasn't thinking about okay what what did I forget you know so yeah. you try to do that and keep that the same so you didn't have to worry about anything like that and then from there you just get over and you start pre I would I always tried to pre visualize mm-hmm. myself nodding and leaving the shoe okay and pretty much after that. Yeah. You know, I just want to make sure that I got a good, clean shot at him leaving there. Yeah. And then after that, it was uh, muscle reflexes, you know, and, and muscle reaction and just your mind just trying to keep up. Mm-hmm. So are you thinking during the ride? Uh, some. Some. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, you don't. It's not so much thinking about what's going on. It's mm-hmm. just the reaction that you have to do mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, just to counteract what, what that bull's making your body do. I see. And, and so it's a thought process, but instantaneous mm-hmm. thought process that makes your body react to that. And if sometimes, on that, especially on them real good bulls, and you can see it on the PBR or anything, you get that one split second that if you could just make that one move mm-hmm. right then, mm-hmm. you'd have got by them. Right. But if you don't, you're done because already the thought process, you've, if you've had to take time to think about it, it's too late. Yeah. So so a couple things, a couple questions I'm going to ask, and thank you for sharing that. One of the things um, that that has to be, you just talked about it, if I'd have done this one move in this one particular split second, I would have, I might have gotten by the bull. So how do you get past the past? How do you move past the past? In other words, let's say you bucked off in six seconds and you come mm-hmm. out and you go, wow, if I'd have made this move or done this, this adjustment or that adjustment, um, I'd have rode the bull. Did you dwell on the past, Mike? Did you dwell on those uh, those buck offs, or how did you think about them? Never. You could never dwell on the past. Mm-hmm. You could only learn from the past. Okay. And it didn't matter whether that bull, if you got in that same position, it wouldn't ever be the same bull. Mm-hmm. Generally, you know, I mean, I have gotten on the same bull several times, different, you know, at different rodeos and stuff, and have made mistakes, but it could be. I could get on a bull back here and and make that small mistake that I still oh, shoot if I'd have just mm-hmm. if I'd have just done this, you know. And I could go out to California and it would be the same basically the same situation, but mm-hmm. your mind, you know, it like I said, it doesn't have time to think about it, it has time to react. So you start to feel that same that same movement that got you in trouble the time before. And you just instantly try to correct it. And it just, it's an automatic, you know, you, that computer brain kicks in there and it just makes your body do what it needs to do if you've kind of pre-programmed it, you yeah, know. Yeah. So by making that mistake the first time, you've pre-programmed, okay, if I feel like that again, this is what I need to do. Okay. And and it worked quite quite often. Not always, but quite often it does. Yeah. Now, so a couple of things. Um did you visualize the ride that you made that bucked you off with the proper move? Could you, because you talked to visualization. Mm-hmm. Would you visualize? Uh, yeah. And not really so much um, on uh, visualizing the mistake and everything. Mm-hmm. You, you know, you'd always want to visualize the perfect ride. Perfect. Perfect. So if okay. I was visualizing something, I was visualizing the perfect move, the yep. perfect at that time. Yeah. I would never visualize what I did wrong. Right. I'd always visualize what I did right. And even if I made that mistake, I would visualize myself doing that right. Yeah. And that would that would help. Yeah. And 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 what what I've kind of learned over some various things is you your your mind has these has a toolbox. It draws on when it needs it. And it sounds like as you 
got bucked off. You said, oh, if I'd have made this move, ch- chip my hip, hips just a little bit, whatever it may have been, that goes into that toolbox. Next time it comes up, that move is underneath you. You go, boom, I got a tool for that. Yep. I love it. Yep. I absolutely love it. Uh, the other thing I was going to ask about is a lot of athletes talk about being in the zone. Mm-hmm. And that's where we're going on the mind programming, the visualization, psycho, psycho cybernetics or whatever it was, right? That was pretty popular in your day. Mm-hmm. Um, talk, did, did you ever get into that zone? And I've heard it described as quiet or almost like watching yourself ride, something like that. It, it, it had a few times. Um, I, can, I can honestly say, I mean, it's happened, but the one time. That I, and it's funny, I'm going to tell you, you won't even believe what you event it was in. <laughs> okay. But okay. I basically had kind of an outer body experience where it looked like I was looking down watching me do something. Yeah. And yeah. it was like I wasn't even there. I mean, it was just, it was the strangest feeling, but it was, it was really uh, a good feeling mm-hmm. when it got all done. But it's in a steer wrestle. Okay. And I caught the steer. You know, I, I remember, you know, going out riding, you know, riding the horse's steer and getting off. <clears throat> and then I don't know, once I got my hands on that steer and slid up to his head, everything slowed down into super, super, super slow motion. Yeah. I, yeah. I just, I can't even explain it except for it just, it just like, and when I threw the steer, and got up, I said, son of a gun, I can't believe I was that, that long. That's a, that was a good steer. Mm-hmm. And when they announced my time, I said, you got to be kidding me. It seemed like it was going to be a six or seven second run. Oh, wow. Okay. Because everything was in my mind was so slow. You know, it just seemed like, you know, yeah, you see the yeah. things on the TV, right? you know, and that's the way it felt, you know, there was no sound and it just looked like I was, 10 feet above this steer looking down and watching me do it. And when I got up and they announced like three, one, I said, <laughs> I thought I was six or something. I said, Oh my goodness. And it won rodeo, but it was, that was the only time it really happened in that depth. Mm-hmm. Uh, bull riding a lot and horse riding, the bareback riding or whatever, and the bronc riding. A lot of times you would get in that zone and everything. You're right. Everything you could, you, you, it was like you was watching a bit of yourself, but mm-hmm. it, I wasn't ever a separate part of that. I was, you know, you, that happened quite often, yeah. especially in a bull ride. You just, you, you just hear every, every time that bull hit the ground or every time he blew or something, you know, and you just went. And most of the time, whenever that happened, it was when you were right on the very edge of being a hero or zero okay. and it's just right there because there wasn't any room for error whatsoever and if it was just a good just a good ordinary ride a lot of times it didn't happen yeah and and so after you experience this like in the steer wrestling bull riding bronc riding like you're talking could you could you work mentally to for that experience to to happen more frequently i mean did you know where your mind had to be um for that to happen or 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 was it like you say only on those really tough very very much on the edge no room for error kind of rides or runs yeah for me that's the only time it happens uh, you know no room for error yeah most of the other rides that were just kind of average rides whether i placed or you know i mean i even could have won first in some rodeos but if it's just a businessman's ride a lot of times it was just a businessman's ride and i could have told you everything that happened mm-hmm. but it wasn't anything super special yeah you know it just seemed to me for me when you get in that zone and you got in that one spot it was just like you if you made one bobble you were dust yeah yeah and yeah. Uh, you know Wow. Okay. This is very cool. I'm, I'm really excited we went here. This is very, very, very interesting. Um, so, so would, if you had a, if you had a run like that on the steer with that, with that, uh, in the zone feel, 
Could you carry it with you to the bull riding? Could you carry it with you to, I guess it'd be the saddle bronc riding after the steer wrestling? Yeah, certainly. Okay. And a lot of times you start riding a bareback ride. If I had a good bareback horse yeah. and, and one, and it would carry through the whole rodeo a lot of times, you know, I mean, I would just seem to have a good rodeo. If it started off good and it'd get hot and get rolling and I might not draw the best and I'd never rode saddle bronc as good as most of them guys out there. Uh, but you know, every once in a while. So a lot of times saddle bronc riding would have been my weak part of the event. So if I had a good bareback ride and a mediocre bronc ride, you know, I mean, the steer wrestling would have been the one that would pick me back up, you know, a little okay. bit. Okay. And if I didn't have a good steer, you know, um, you know, it, it just, it didn't make a huge difference, but it seemed like, boy, if you ever got in the click, got going and it would work the other way around just mm -hmm. as well too. Mm -hmm. If I had a, <laughs> if I had a bad bareback horse or just, there were some times that, you know, that, uh, you just didn't have a good day Yeah, yeah and yeah. nothing went right in none of the events. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about that. I mean, we're, we're talking about a drought here, right? Um, yep. you're on a run, you're on a roll, you're making money and a day hits. Um, nothing works in, in any of the events, none of the four events. And it, it's expensive, right? To go down the road. It's expensive to pay the entry fees. Um, t tell us about the droughts and what do you do? What did you do when you got into a drought like this? I mean, was it, was it rodeo? I mean, was there a number of rodeos where it just didn't click? And then, yeah. So what was a drought like, Mike? Well, the, the one time I can really remember, mm -hmm. I was working a job down in Florida for a contractor down there and, and still rodeoing full time. He was great. He rodeoed a little bit himself so we could go. He didn't mind us taking off and going to some rodeos. Um, and I got in a slump. I just got, I, I don't know what caused it, what started, because I was riding pretty good down there and all of a sudden, whether it wasn't drawn right or what, but I went almost a month without winning anything and i was going wasn't going super hard because there wasn't a ton of rodeos at that time of the year to go to i think it was in maybe february march somewhere in there um but i had entered i had entered some rodeos and, and i might even been with jack at the time too mm -hmm. but uh i had gone like i said almost a month and i was working for ronnie and i I was broke, and I went to Ron, my boss there, and he owned a company. I said, Ron, I said, I need to go to some rodeos. I'm not doing good. I need to borrow some money, mm -hmm. and I'll work it off. If I come back with no money, I'll stay here and work it off. Mm -hmm. He said, okay, how much you need? And I said, I need $1,000. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, and, you know, back in the uh, – late 70s early 80s that's that's a decent amount of, of money. money yeah that's uh, well, mess for one weekend so i i had entered i had entered like three three rodeos that weekend maybe and i think we were out in louisiana and uh i entered this rodeo we were out there and i i know i was with jack and uh but anyway <clears throat> um nothing in the bareback ride didn't, mm -hmm. didn't do nothing. Mm -hmm. It was rainy and messed and mm -hmm. steer wrestling. I, I don't even remember if I caught my steer or not, you know, but I didn't place. You know, I knew I hadn't placed. This is a Sunday. This is a Sunday performance where they're the last performance. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> bonk riding, I didn't do anything. And I'm getting on my bowl and I'm, I'm saying, you know, here we go again. I'm going to go back. I'm $1,000 in the hole. Um, got to, you know, I borrowed that money and I says, what the heck? And, uh, so I'm sitting there and now I hear the announcement in the background. Now I'm, cause my mind is really starting to, you know, mm -hmm. play games with me, you mm -hmm. know, and, mm -hmm. and, uh, the announcer starts announcing the bull that I had. I didn't know anything about it. First time I'd ever been in this contract with rodeo mm -hmm. and, uh, it had been raining. The mud was pretty deep and, uh, now this bull has not been ridden in three years. He's an unridden oh, wow. bull. Oh, and uh, he was breaking on the bull and everything going on. <clears throat> and I said, oh, yeah, here we go again. I'm going home broke. Yeah, yeah. 
And then all of a sudden, I said, you whiny little crybaby. <laughs> I'm telling myself, you sorry, snot-nosed little brat. Yeah. Shut up. Yeah. You got the best bull here. Yeah. And if you're going to ride him, you got the best chance because the mud's deep enough. It's yeah. going to slow him down. Yeah. Get your head out of your butt, boy. Yeah. And go do something. Yeah. Yeah. And I jumped out there and this son of a gun turned back and licked his rear end and I went to hammer on him. Yeah. And I mean, just everything clicked like it was yeah. supposed to. Okay. And I won the bull riding and paid $380, but that was the start of me really knowing where my, where my, uh, mentality really okay. needed to be. Okay. And, and yeah. how would you, where, where your mentality needed to be, what, how would you describe that? Um, what, yeah, what clicked, how would you describe it? Yes. Don't feel sorry for yourself. Right. Don't, don't think you're going to get bucked off before you get on this darn bull. Right. Right. What, right. yeah. What became your mindset? It was just, you know, from then on, I knew that there wasn't any bull that could throw me off if I, if everything went right. And I know things don't always go right, you know, and you do what you can do, but um, it was just one of them things that you, I can't ever let myself get into that slump position again because it seemed like the longer it went on, the more mm-hmm. I I tried too hard. And yeah. when I rode my best, when I when I rode my best, I was just happy, go lucky, jumping around, singing, screwing around, having fun. And when it got to where I was starting in that slump, I was trying too hard. I wasn't having fun anymore it was it was getting to become a chore to get my mind to where i wasn't worried about having to win money mm-hmm. and once i if i had pocket full of money i'd win okay. if i if i was broke then you know i really had to i really had to change my attitude and my outlook because that's the way i rode best is you know just it didn't matter we're here here having fun kind of like i was telling you last time you know that that uh I couldn't understand why, you know, Jimmy said that he was rodeoing to make money, which I I knew he was there, but that's not why I started. Mm-hmm. I was started rodeoing because I just wanted to have fun. I was just having a good time. And when it got to where it wasn't such a good time, I didn't do so good. Yeah, yeah. You know? I mean, I could I could and won, won money when it wasn't, but my attitude, if my attitude wasn't right, I wasn't riding to my potential. Yeah. And and it sounds like you had enough self awareness <laughs> that when your attitude wasn't right, you knew it wasn't right, and and uh, and sounds like you could make a choice. We can, yeah. yeah yeah we can adjust this here just a little bit. Yeah. yeah and and then sometimes I I tried to adjust it too much because then it became fake. Okay. You know. Okay. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna have fun. You know, I start yeah. screwing around, and really, it, it, it my mind wasn't where. My heart was at, you know, and uh, so so there was a lot of lot of learning, and yeah. it took took years. I mean, it didn't happen overnight, you know. It took a, a couple of years of getting a lot of that figured out. Yeah, and and running four events, um, average, yeah, average weekend. You're going to go to how many shows in the summer in Jack Wiseman's truck? How many how many different rodeos are you going to be at in a weekend? Let's say starting. Let's just start on Friday and run through Sunday night. Just to make it easy. Well, we de- we definitely at least make three, and sometimes five. Okay. Yeah. You know, and I think there were one week we went to. Well, it might have been ten days. We went to like seven or eight rodeos in, in ten days, in that stretch. Okay. And we made them all. You know, we didn't just enter them. We yeah. were there at them, competing at them. Yeah. yeah. And and if you're if you're doing four events at every one, you better have a roll of cash in your pocket. <laughs> Just to pay the darn entry fees. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, it took a yeah. lot of You had to have a bankroll to go down the road. Never mind eating. Never mind, never mind putting, you know, putting your share into the kitty yeah. for the fuel. Yeah. Well, that was, that always came first. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you you yeah. kiddied up first when you got in the truck. And Jack was, Jack had been around the horn enough, and he'd been up and down the road. He, you know, he'd gotten broke a few times himself, you know, and so... That was the first thing. You get to the truck, you you kitty up so we got gas money to get there. Then we'll worry about the other stuff afterwards. And uh, they, I had a lot 
of super good secretaries. And back then, mm-hmm. you know, going to the IPRA and APRA rodeos, you know, they pretty much knew coming in, um, you know, who who was hands and who weren't. And if right. you were in a jack truck, you were hands. Right. Period. Right. You know, and uh, it, I was probably the least talented hand in that truck ever mm. but it, mm. it just he but when you, i learned a lot of things and, and listening you know talking listening to champions and stuff yeah and some of these secretaries were just such sweethearts mm. I, I might get to rodeo and be entering for events and not have a nickel on me right you know i mean right. it, and because we've been going and say look can you you know can you stand for my fees mm-hmm. that you know and if i win something you know take your money out. Mm-hmm. If I don't, uh, you know, I'll talk to you next week and, mm-hmm. you know, we'll get something figured out. And uh, I'll tell you there, Kathy Myers and she, if she had ever charged me interest on some of the, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> she, she wouldn't have had to work. <laughs> yeah. And there were a lot of, there were several of them like that, that they just trusted us. And, you know, and we never stiffed anybody and, yep, yep. you know, and there were two or three of us in Jack's truck. They had to do that, you know, yeah. once in a while. Yeah. Not all the time, but, you know, and it was, I think you'd see the relief on their face if you came and you paid your fees. You know? yeah. <laughs> oh, boy, oh yeah. he's got, he's he's done got good, cash. You know? <laughs> I don't have to worry about it this time, you know, and, but very, very seldom if we got to that position, you yeah. know, very yeah. seldom would, would uh, they ever, they'd never say anything, you know, but they, Usually by the next week we had them paid off or right, right. send them a check in the mail or something. So yeah, and and what uh, I want to make sure everybody's clear: if you're going to five or six rodeos, let's say in a weekend, you're fronting all your you're fronting all your entry fees. Well, if you rode somewhere on a Friday night, the winner might not be known until Sunday night. Correct. So your cash, even though you won the rodeo, let's say in a couple events, you've got the money coming, but it may take a while for that money to find you. Oh, yeah. 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 So you outrun and, and, the money in some cases. Oh, most of the time. Yeah. Because the only times you ever did get paid is when you're at the last performance. Yeah. Yeah. Of that rodeo is either a Saturday night out, like out in Oklahoma, excuse me, out in Oklahoma, Texas. You know, they're usually Saturday night was there end of their performance so if we could get out there on a saturday night and then come back closer to the east and go to like jay bar jay's rodeo up in michigan or in the midwest in indiana it'd be a sunday rodeo so that's the way we tried to set up so that when we're making them runs we tried to get as many paydays in a week as we could get yeah yeah you know the paydays yeah. are, are the, the final performance yeah yeah and if you didn't like you said you know if i if i went and paid my fees you know on a thursday night in oklahoma somewhere and and uh on Friday, paid my fees at another one in Oklahoma or, or back this way. By the time we got back to Sunday mm-hmm. at JRJ Rodeo, and, you know, you go up to Miss Maggie and say, Miss Maggie, I don't have any money. Could you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. What do you got, God, boy? <laughs> so, oh, you got <laughs> night jacket? Okay, you know? okay. Uh, you know, but you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it, it was, it was, it, um, I don't think we could do it now right, with the right. computer entries and stuff like that. Not having control of where we were, we uh, nowadays with everything going through the computer, uh, you don't have that control of where we're going to go and you know what what performance you're going to be out. How, you know, I mean, like we did back then. You know, yeah. especially that many guys. Yeah. You know, you can only travel with a couple guys now, and. Uh, you know, I don't know how these guys can do it. I really don't. No. So but that's that's kind of how we got through a lot of it. Okay, and just to give just to give a bit of perspective here, you crawl in the truck. Let's say Friday morning, right? You know you're not getting back till maybe Monday morning, um, and you know you're going to hit three rodeos. So that's twelve different events you're going to be competing in. You better have how much in your pocket, Mike to to get started between fuel food and entry fees how much had you better be packing well i couldn't leave less than a thousand dollars right right then you know i mean a lot of the entry fees were probably probably averaged around fifty dollars an entry fee okay um i i would say on the average for the average rodeos back then 
uh, you know, some were a lot bigger, but, you know, I would say probably 50 uh, would be a good average number for an entry fee at, at something that we would go to. Yeah, so I'm Googling real quick while you're talking. Uh, $1,000 in 1979, just put in perspective, is worth how much today? Uh, you better have, it, it says better have about $4,000 in your pocket. So you need about four grand to do right now what you would have been doing then, Mike. Mm. And you think oh. of your price of fuel, right? You yeah. were probably paying, oh. what, a dollar sixty a gallon or something going down the road at that point. Um, right. Anyway, that's that's and, just... And the, the nice thing yeah. about, you know, and I mean, your fuel price were down, but when you got that many guys kicking in, Absolutely. 20 bucks to get you all all weekend, you know, you, you throw $50 in the kitty, you're you're going to go to a lot, oh, you're yeah. going to, yeah. a lot of miles. You bet. Even though the truck was only getting seven, eight, nine months a gallon, yeah. you know, but uh, still, you know, we, we were able to get around it. And, okay. You know, and that's what, by going through and learning from Jack and how he set things up and stuff, when I finished going you know, got out of his truck and started running my own and running my own crew. I pretty much patterned exactly what we did. Okay. So you would run books and everything. So let me, let me wrap up in 1979 here. Just, uh, so in 19, 1979, I show that you won the all around championship in the American professional rodeo association that year. Anything else stand out, um, about 1979, you're still not going as hard as you ultimately go, right? Well, not as much as I did later on, yeah. but I went hard enough. I I qualified for the IFR in four events. And qualified, yeah. okay. And and for the record, you've done that three times. Yeah, I believe so. To the yeah, IFR. Consecutive. And yeah, and consecutive times. Yeah, and and when you th- when and I just want to make sure our listeners understand this. There's a lot of one event specialists out there. They ride bulls. They'll work all year to get to the finals. Um, they might be a bronc rider. You're going to work all year to get enough money, one, to get to the finals. And now you're doing it in four events. So the odds of getting enough money in all those individual events is pretty incredible. That means you've got to be top of your game in all four of those events. And you did that a record three times qualified at that time it was Oklahoma city. The IFR no, it, was no, it, was it was in Tulsa. It was in Tulsa. Okay. It was in Tulsa at that time. Okay. Yep. And, and when you set out the beginning of 1979, what was your goal? Did you have goals? Oh yeah. You had to have goals. I, I, I wanted to make the IFR. And at that time I was, my bareback riding was my, mainstay um i i made more money riding bareback horses uh right then and i felt that i did than i did in the other events okay you know okay but um when i started going hard like that the other events started coming okay yeah you, know, you know um i was i was really considered myself a bareback rider first, then a bull rider, and then steer wrestler, and then a saddle bronc. Really? Saddle bronc yeah. was last? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And and if you had to be a one-event specialist, you'd have been a bareback rider? Yeah, I believe so. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And I tried to, <laughs> Jay Bar J, I, I tried, I go to their rodeos and get the bull riding and all, they, they slam dunk me there for a long time. I couldn't get and I actually tried to quit riding bulls, and it lasted about two weeks. And I said, you know what? If you're going to go back and do this, you better you better figure out how to get good at it because you ain't going to keep paying these entry fees to get thrown on the ground. And then yeah. things started coming. Yeah. coming okay. Okay. <laughs> and 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 I'm assuming there, and I just this just dawned on me. I'm assuming if I'm winning money in the bareback riding, and the other events start costing me money. Right. <laughs> yep. You say, "Hey, when when are you guys going to get your act together, bull rider and saddle bronc rider yeah, and steer yeah, wrestler? Yeah, 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 <laughs> You're spending yeah. my money." <laughs> yeah. Exactly right. Yeah. But, uh, okay. Yeah, the, the, yep. So so seventy nine, you you jump in the truck, and you said did that two three years. Okay. Mm-hmm. 
So I show, and this this is just you can correct all this. I, I find I found uh, some some uh, year end stuff. Nineteen eighty two Northeast region of the IPRA International Professional Road Association. You were the regional all around champion. Mm-hmm. Okay, nineteen eighty three. You won the bareback bronc riding championship in the APRA, and again you repeat as the Northeast regional champion of the IPRA. Nineteen eighty four all-around champion of the APRA and Northeast region all-around. And you did that in 84, 86, 87, 88, and 1990, you win the all-around championship. So talk a little bit about that 82 through 19, let's just go, uh, yeah, to 1990. What do you remember about those years? Oh. Being able to take and and go to the rodeos, especially back here in the Northeast, because there was a lot of money back back in those years. There was more money back here in the Northeast than there was out in the Midwest and out in Oklahoma and out through that way for us to go and win. So was there that more, the out, Andy Camp rodeos? A lot of them were Andy Camp. Um, there were. Um, World's Tough has come back and did a few back here, like in Toronto and some of them. So there were quite a few, like I said before, they were co-sanctioned rodeos. Mm -hmm. So if I had my APRA card, a lot of them were co-sanctioned with the IPRA. So the the points that count both ways. Uh, So if it was a APRA, IRA rodeo co-sanctioned, let's say Attica, for instance, I think a couple times. So if I would go to Attica, it would still count for the IPRA World Championship points. Mm-hmm. So I was able to make points both ways. So that's that's pretty much why I could be out on the road going to a lot of the IPRA rodeos during the summer out in the Midwest and out through that way and still be able to, you know, kind of keep up with them back here because when I come back here, um, you know, I, I would – and did well, then, you know, that my points would come back here, but it would add on to my world championship points too at the same time. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and having the coast sanctioned, um, yeah, that had to make a big, big difference. Um, and, and when did they start doing that? Do you know? I, I don't know. Um, kind of when they kind of started doing that is when the Cowboys started not, not getting as many contestants, mm-hmm. especially in rough stock riding, mm-hmm. and they they wound up starting to do something. But I remember going to some of the rodeos, like uh, Attica would have 30, 40 bareback riders entered for the weekend, and they'd have 80, 80, 90 bull riders. And then all of a sudden, things I think there was a lot of things I think that contributed to it. But you know, uh, a lot of these guys that um, they just couldn't go and compete all the time like we were, you know, and mm-hmm. they just finally give up, you know, and I okay. think the economy is starting to turn around. But the, the those years that I went, um, a lot of those years I had my, I had my truck. I was, you know, like Captain Jack, you know, I mean, and start taking these guys to them. And we had, we had, and I had a truckload of talent, you know, mm-hmm. Sam was with me, Kenny Phillips, uh, Paul Garrison, Larry Johnson. There were some guys that could have been world champions if they if they wanted to go and do something like, you know, and, and Eddie Prozier, Joe Farley and Burn Edwards, you know, back in the earlier years, they kind of got out a little bit early. But, you know, uh, yeah, we just – and that's what I remember, just being able to take some of these young guys and go and compete. And, and they knew when we pulled in, we were going to be a threat Mm -hmm. and it was just, it was just a lot of fun. You know, we, we just had a lot of fun doing it. So what year would that be, Mike, when you started up your truck and how long did you run it? Oh, well, part of it started a a little bit of started in, you know, 78, 79, but mostly when it, when it really got rolling was probably 82 ish in there. Yeah, Um, Yeah. And I hauled I hauled uh, a couple calf ropers that made the IFR, you know, Timmy Buckemeyer, Jeff Sawyer. So we hauled horses most all the time. I was bulldogging, and a lot of times I would have a 
at least a bull riding horse if I didn't have, you know, uh, my wife, you know, she might, uh, sometimes she could haze off her horse, but most of the time I'd just get a hazer while I was there, you know, and uh, have somebody else haze for me. But So we were pulling a trailer and we had, you know, seven, eight guys. I had as many as 11 guys. And it's a really? straight cab, straight cab pickup with a, uh, camper top on, on the back. And it was almost all bad slider rigging bags underneath there. And they find a whole boys and we're in here and we're going to some rodeos. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we did that. And that was, we had a lot of fun doing it. 11 guys in a, in a, a two door pickup truck. No, no club cab, right? No club cab. <laughs> right. Take the back window out of the, out of the yeah, yeah, back yeah. of the truck and yeah. take the window out of the camper top. And then the one, the one big one, better one we had, they had all the guys in there. It would, it would bolt on top of the box. So it wasn't a camper so much. It was just a shell. Okay. But it had an overhead, had the bed in the overhead. And then we put the planks across the bed. Mm-hmm. And uh, mm-hmm. and had the had it come almost to the back door, so that you could you could lay, I think like six guys could lay in the in the bed across, and a couple guys up on top, and then the front was always had three guys in the front. So yeah, we we get packed in there and we go. So uh, so so share with us accidents, near misses, adventures, whatever you want to call them. I mean, because you were, how many miles a year were you guys hauling? When you were running, 1982 and all, 11 guys packed in, how many How many miles would you go travel well, in a year? Oh, we Anywhere from 90 to 120. 90 to 120,000 miles. Yeah. I'll be darned. So lots of night driving, all night driving, right? Yeah. And you the only driver? Oh, no. No, I I made everybody had to take their turn somewhere along the line. Everybody rotated Sometimes in. it wasn't very safe and it yeah. wasn't a very smart idea. Yeah, but, yeah. You know, and it, but we got so, through it. So you had a bumper, horse, trailer, three horse, four horse bumper? It depended. I started out, I had a, a two horse in line. Okay. Um, and when I had, like, Jeff Sawyer was hauling his man and stuff, you know, it just Sometimes we'd only have his horse on there, but, you know, there's, there are other times, you know, because I didn't always have a bulldog horse. Okay. And okay. Uh, so, you know, we traded. And then I went and uh, went out there and when we were in Oklahoma, I bought a, a little 12 foot stock trailer so we could haul three horses okay. a little bit easier, oh, you okay. know. Okay. So uh, I traded up some trailers once in a while and, and uh, just depended on who I had going with me. And sometimes we'd have to, if uh, somebody else needed to go, we might have to borrow a trailer that would fit to what we had to take, you know, but yeah. generally it was just, generally it was either a three or four horse, uh, you know, most of the time. Okay. So back to my question, accidents, near misses, adventures, all night runs, sleet, rain, Run into, you know, you're out in the spring, snow probably somewhere, sleet probably somewhere. What comes to mind when you think of think of uh, traveling stories? You ain't got enough time for this. That's a whole new set. Give, <laughs> give, I'm, I'm okay. I'm okay. Give me one that comes to mind. Or if you want to wait, we can oh, wait. Dear. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of them. Uh, you yeah. know, ice storms and stuff yeah. going out yeah. there. I, I drove down to, I, I'd left here, a friend of mine was a steer wrestler, well, Harold Oakley's uh, bulldog, and he was in Jack's truck with us a lot of times. And anyway, his wife had made the IFR in, in Tulsa, and I had made it, and I was going out there, and Harold had called me up, and he says, Mike, he says, you know, because they were, we were going to have bad weather going out there. He said, would you, uh, could I could I talk you into coming down and picking up Julie and, taking her out to uh, the IFR. And uh, he said, I just don't want her to drive out through there by herself. Mm-hmm. I said, sure. So I drove from here down to Richmond, Virginia, and got her and her horse and trailer, used her trailer, and and uh, we went out there. And, oh, we hit the worst stinking ice storm. Mm-hmm. Uh, that mm-hmm. just started about, I don't know, about 10 o'clock at night, and 
I think we finally, I, I just couldn't go anymore. And we were, um, I was following a, a salt truck. Well, we're in the middle of the hills of Tennessee, and they don't have much for salt trucks down mm-hmm. there. Not mm-hmm. like they do up here at all. Mm-hmm. And it was just treacherous, you know, 10, 15 mile an hour, and just kind of getting along and being careful. And finally, about 2 o'clock, I said, Julie, I said, I can't go no more. We got to get off this road and we got to, even if we have to stay in the truck or whatever, I said, this isn't going to turn out very well. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mm -hmm. so we did get off. We did find a room, you know, and got a motel and Mm -hmm. and got some sleep and got up in the morning while the sun come out. And we waited till about 10 o'clock and a lot of it had started to melt off, you know, so Mm -hmm. that was, that was, a hairy one there, yeah, you know, we've yeah. had a few other ones, but that one there, and we got there and got safe and everything, everything worked out well, you know, but, you know, it's just, uh, but some of them, uh, I'm not supposed to be alive and I guarantee yeah, yeah, that there's yeah. some, some trips that were just, and stupid stuff, you know, I'm trying to get home. I've been gone for six months and mm-hmm. down in Florida and coming back and I'd rent three rodeos on the way home and, mm-hmm. you know, started out on a Friday night down in Florida and then drove the next one up. And then I think the last one was in Kentucky on Sunday afternoon and I'm coming through and I, I remember getting on, um, I was on 71 coming up through Cincinnati and, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and, uh, headed to Columbus. And I remember going through Cincinnati, everything's fine. And it was raining. And it was just, you know, starting to get dark. Windshield wipers are going. Next thing I remember, I woke up in Columbus. Oh, jeez. Oh, and uh, I'm by myself. I got a horse trailer. I got a two-horse inline with a horse on the back. Yeah. And uh, so I'm kind of going through there. Well, I wake up. Oh, okay. You know, and yeah. start going well. <clears throat> the next time I woke up, um. I had missed my turn on 271 to get off 71 to go up towards Erie yeah, in that yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. And the next time I woke up, I had already gone through the third set of rumble strips oh, and flashed geez. lights on 71 where it comes up to the lake and goes to 90. Yeah, yeah. And it's a 35 mile yep, an hour. Yep, yep. And in Cleveland there. Yep. You know, it kind of and and what woke me up, it wasn't the rumble strips. It was. Uh, my guardian angel saying, Mike, Mike. And I just, and nobody was with me. Boy, mm-hmm. that kind of, mm-hmm. the first thing I did was I looked down because mm-hmm. I'd seen where, you know, through the rumble steps and 35 mile an hour zone, and I was running 70. Oh, jeez. And uh, the wall was right there. Oh, oh my. Oh, <laughs> I locked my. it up. Yeah. And a good thing the brakes were working good on the trailer. Yeah. I locked it up. And if anybody's ever hauled an inline, you know they can jackknife pretty fast. Yeah. And I kind of slid around into that curve. Oh, and wow. as soon as I got into the curve, I punched it. And uh, I don't know why. I mean, yeah, <laughs> not that yeah. kind of a, yeah. Yeah, and I just punched it for all it was worth. And it snapped right out of yep. it. And yep. Yep. I made it. Yep. I was pretty wide awake until I got to Buffalo. <laughs> that got you. So I that got you. Yeah. Yeah. And the worst of it is, yeah. the dumb yeah. thing of it is, yeah. is, all I had to do was pull over. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I didn't have to get home, right. you know, to, right. you know, so it's, it's things like that, that I know God had, had really helped me down the road. And he's kept me alive through a few, a few things like that, you know, but, uh, it's just, you know, after a couple other incidences and, and, you know, and try to take some pills to stay awake and stuff. And finally, you know, the, the, the one that I did take, uh, one time it was supposed to be real hot. I was supposed to be, you know, go. Well, I fell asleep. I couldn't stay awake. And I finally, I pulled over and I said, you know what? And then ever since then, I said, I do not need any help. You know, if I'm going to get tired, I'm going to have to pull over, even if it's a, and everybody teases me now because I can sit down and take a 15 minute cat nap and I'm yeah. ready to roll, yeah. you know, yeah. Yeah. and that's, that's all I needed to do. You know, I needed to learn that, you know, just let your mind just rest and get regenerated 15 minutes half hour and you're you know you're pretty good so a lot of things that god has allowed me to live when i'm not supposed to be alive and and just go through some things like that 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 i learned you know throughout the years that that uh yeah there's some exciting 
very exciting time. So. Yeah, I'll say, <laughs> I'll say, my goodness, my goodness, I'm, I'm, thank you so much for sharing that. This is, this has been a neat conversation this evening, Mike. I really, really, really have enjoyed it. Um, I think that's enough for tonight. It seems like we're in. A, I don't know how to follow up, uh, <laughs> follow that up. Quite frankly, and I don't think we want to. So well, um, we could probably do a whole session on on little miracles and things that's happened to me over the years. I am <laughs> wide open on that. In our next episode with Mike, we'll pick up where we left off starting the 1990s. I will remember to ask Mike to tell us more traveling stories and the miracles that he mentioned that he has experienced. Who knows, it may turn into a three hours type of episode, rodeo wrestling and racing, about the way we see the world. I've added some links from my research in the notes for your review. To make your listening easier, you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. Search for Beyond the Shoots and follow us. Hey, I did Google search the other day. I Googled Mike Swearingen Rodeo and his earlier YouTube videos on Beyond the Shoots. His episode showed up. Now, remember, check out the New York State Rodeo Museum Facebook group page and become a member. We also have a Facebook page for Beyond the Shoots. Become a friend and like and follow. <laughs> say, say hello. Ask some questions. Leave some comments. We love any feedback we can get. Parasite system is a push button, parasitic diagnostic system for pasture animals, horses, cattle, goats, sheep, and chickens, and for your companion animals, your dogs and cats. Get focused on treatment. Get the data you need to properly treat your animals for the exact infestation that they are carrying. And you can find them at parasitesystems.com. Now this is Beyond the Shoots. Until next time. Stay cool, stay hydrated. I hope you enjoy your week. This is Doug Simcox. Thank you for listening.